Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, storytelling in general and screenwriting in particular. And uh, before I start this talk, I'm going to make three assumptions. One is that some of you are writers. Two is that some of you want to be writers. And three is that all of you have a story to tell. I'm going to touch on three provocative thoughts for the screenwriter in this talk, which I call Lie, Cheat, and Steal. Um, and after the talk, I'm going to ask each of you to do something really difficult. I'm going to set an exercise for each of you to do. Finally, I'm going to leave you with two things of value to take away. So uh, here's the talk called Lie, Cheat, and Steal. And the first provocation is this. Art is a lie. Well, when I first come across this idea, uh, it was really upsetting to me. It was very disturbing. I was an actor. I took acting very seriously. I was very into Stanislavski and a sense of truth. And the notion of art is a lie made me feel very uncomfortable. But um, this is not the entire quote. The entire quote, and it's from Picasso, goes like this. Art is a lie that enables us to see the truth more clearly. Our task as artists is to convince others of the truthfulness of our lies. So in other words, not all lies are art, but all art is a lie. So when I thought about this as an actor, I thought, well, what is the lie of the actor? What is the lie of the actor? Well, the actor inhabits a world of make-believe. We come together. Uh, we are assigned roles. I'm the father. You're the son. I'm the husband. You're the wife. Uh, and we only met a couple of hours ago. But we're going to work on this. We work on this to make it believable to such an extent that an audience will suspend their disbelief and they will accept us as three sisters, as a family. And uh, essentially, that is the lie of the actor. And of course, it's a very childish thing, really. There's something very childlike about it. And uh, Rod Steiger said that acting is not a job for a grown-up. And in many ways, it isn't. <laughs> because you notice, children, how when you, the facility with which they pick up a stick, it becomes a sword. They take a chair, it becomes a throne. It's a very easy thing for them. Uh, and there's a marvelous anecdote about a, a little story about Picasso, who um, he's uh, at this exhibition of his own work, and a woman is so outraged. She is so outraged about what she sees on the walls that she storms across the gallery, walks up to Picasso, confronts him, looks him in the eyes, and she says, this is ridiculous. A child of six could do this. And Picasso said, well, yes, probably a child of six could do this. But if he could do it at my age, he'd be a genius. <laughs> so I think what the actor is trying to do is to, uh, what the actor is trying to do is to reclaim that childlike ability to believe and to make her lies believable. But it's not just the actor. What is the lie of the designer? The designer takes a door that leads to a studio wall and makes that door look as if it doesn't lead to a studio wall. It leads to a bedroom. It leads to a bathroom. And that lie is reinforced by a lighting designer, by a scene painter, and of course by an actor who will exit as if he's going to a bedroom and enter as if he's just come from a bedroom. But what about the lie of the prop maker? What is the prop maker doing? Well, the prop maker takes a glass of water and into that glass of water pours a little liquid brown sugar. And that water starts to change color and become a kind of amber. It looks like whiskey. And so the actor picks it up. It looks like whiskey. Smells it. It smells like whiskey. Tastes it. It is whiskey. <laughs> There's something magical about that sort of transformation, the lie of the prop maker. So the secret of a good production, I think, the secret of a good production is to get everybody involved to tell the same lie. And if you all tell the same lie, it will stand up in court. And by court, I mean the court of public opinion. And by the court of public opinion, I mean the audience. They will believe it. Dustin Hoffman said, I first knew I could act when I knew I could lie. Marlon Brando, who had contempt for acting in many ways, but he conducted some workshops on acting late in his life, 
and he called those workshops Lying for a Living. There's a marvelous documentary about Fellini called I Am a Born Liar. So what is the lie of the writer? Well, the writer knows that art is not the same as life. Art makes sense in a way that life doesn't. And maybe because our lives don't make sense, that's why we need art. The writer knows that drama is not the same as life. Life is a really complicated thing. Um, in drama, though, everything makes sense. There is a reason for something in drama. Why does she say this? My, my character wouldn't do that. There is a reason for everything in drama. But the dramatist is actually using uh, the materials of life, that avalanche of meaningless event that constitutes your life. And what the dramatist does is subject it to the laws of, of art to uh, reconfigure it, to rearrange it, uh, to uh, distort it in many ways, to lie in many ways, to cheat in many ways, and then represent that back to the audience in a form that somehow manages to convey meaning. I mean, for example, it is not uncommon in drama to condense 12 years of a man's life into two hours of screen time. That is an enormous distortion. But the challenge is to make it seem truthful. Characters are not the same as people. People are very unpredictable. They're really difficult to understand. You don't know what they're going to do next. But characters are a kind of condensed, structured form of a person. There is a kind of consistency to a character. A character's actions are united by the pursuit of one singular goal. Even the most complex of characters, uh, they are endowed with perhaps one attitudinal trait. Dialogue is not the same as conversation. We all know what conversation is, but dialogue is a kind of selected, structured, stylized version of conversation. It is ordered in the form of units of action. But once again, your job is to make it seem real, to make it seem truthful, to make it believable. You are, in essence, if you saw the job advertised in the newspaper, it would read roughly like this. You know, that you're a profession, you are professional liars. Your job is to engage, enchant, seduce, and ultimately convince an audience as you illuminate a truth. The second provocation is to do with anxiety. Uh, this is something I've been working on for a long time and I find really, really interesting. And I think it's this, one of the essential keys to drama. And I first started thinking about this when I was looking at the work of Ernst Fischer, and particularly a book of his called The Necessity of Art, where Ernst Fischer looks at this question of why do people go to the movies? Why do they go and uh, sit amongst a group of strangers looking at a flickering screen and immerse themselves, lose themselves in the problems of other people? What is wrong with their lives that they need that kind of experience? Well, he's, from sort of uh, looking at this, I started to develop this theory about anxiety and that the real connection was to do with the anxiety of the audience which is being addressed on the screen. And there are two kinds of anxiety. The first is thematic anxiety. The second is narrative anxiety. So let's have a look at thematic anxiety first. What does thematic anxiety mean? It means, what is your movie about? What is it really about? And when I first came to America, I found that I was not the only person thinking this. I went to a lecture by a guy called Lodge Kerrigan. And Lodge Kerrigan is a writer-director who uh, had got a really interesting film called Keen that he was launching. And this is how he launched it. He said, when I was thinking about this uh, film, I asked myself this question, what am I afraid of? And he decided that I'm afraid of losing my daughter and losing my mind. And so I thought I'd write a movie about a man who loses his daughter and loses his mind. And <laughs> this is actually quite an interesting approach to writing. And, and Spielberg has written about this a lot, has, uh, has been interviewed about this a lot, about the way that uh, movies that come to have meaning are the movies that help you address your fears and your anxieties. Let's have a look at a few obvious, obvious, obvious examples. There's nothing clever about this. These are so obvious. Home Alone. What's Home Alone about? What's it really about? Home Alone, very successful movie, connects with a lot of people. Home Alone is about a child's anxiety, a child's anxiety of being abandoned. So children are going to connect with this. But it's not just that. It also 
addresses the parental anxiety, the anxiety that all parents have of leaving their child in danger. So this is quite clever because it connects with two demographics here, children and parents. Silence of the Lambs. Well, what is Silence of the Lambs? What is it about? What's it really about? Well, Silence of the Lambs is a woman's movie. It addresses, there is something that women know. Women know that there are monsters who live in society. And they don't live a long way away. They actually live in your neighborhood, <laughs> fairly close to where you live, possibly on your block. And if I were you, I would not run away to the suburbs because there, there's an awful lot of them live out there. <laughs> and I definitely would not go to the countryside because they carry axes out there. <laughs> so Home Alone addresses that woman's, women's fear of the monsters that live in society. Uh, I could give many, many examples, but let's just jump to Mean Girls. What is Mean Girls? What is Mean Girls about? Well, Mean Girls is a type of movie. You've seen lots of these movies, but who are they speaking to? Uh, who's connecting to this? What is the anxiety that's being addressed here? Well, this is to do with a, this is a teenage film, obviously. It addresses that period in your life between uh, being a child and being an adult, those adolescent teenage years, which are absolutely fraught with anxiety about Will I be accepted? Will I be excluded? Will I be included? Am I mature enough? Am I immature? Will people like me? All of these kinds of anxieties. Uh, that te and of course, there is a wealth of movies, and every generation has to write their own teenage movies, going back to uh, Rebel Without a Cause, going through all those John Hughes movies, Sixteen Candles, Pretty in Pink, Bre Breakfast Club, coming up to today with things like Gossip Girl, Girls. All of these movies are addressing that anxiety of that particular group of people who are uncomfortable. Uh, Saving Private Ryan. Well, Saving Private Ryan. What is Saving Private Ryan about? What's it really about? Saving, Prime Ryan, Saving Private Ryan is in many ways a generic film. It's a kind of war movie, Second World War. And it's a particular kind of story. But what is it really about? Why am I watching it in the 21st century? What is it actually saying to me in the 21st century? Well, Spielberg is really aware of what he's doing. And what he does which is very clever, he finds some level of anxiety uh, that is going to connect thematically with his audience. This is a movie about moral anxiety. Are we good? So how does he do this? He puts a little prologue at the beginning, and he puts a little epical epilogue at the end, and then he threads that, uh, uh, that uh, thread of meaning throughout the whole film. Now let's look at exactly what he does. He starts the film today, on an anniversary of, uh, Normandy, of the Normandy landings. And he has some veterans go back to those fields, fields of, uh, uh, of gravestones. A veteran goes back to visit uh, <coughs> his comrades who died. So they tell the whole story. And at the very end, in a very Shakespearean manner, Spielberg spells out exactly what he wants you to think and tells you exactly why you're watching the movie. The guy is kneeling now. Uh, at the grave of his friend, and his wife is with him, and he asks the question that the movie poses. For you, poses for you, the current audience, have I led a good life? Have I let these people down? And of course we have. I don't think I need to say much about the Wolf of Wall Street, <laughs> because what anxiety is this, is this addressing? I mean, uh, we are walking on uh, ice, fragile ice, which is about to crack any day now. If the whole system comes crashing down on Tuesday, you won't be wildly surprised. There is a wealth of films that address this. Uh, boiler Room, Too Big to Fail, Arbitrage, Margin Call. I mean, there's some fantastic films that address this recently. And there is a reason why those films are coming out, because they know what you are worried about, what is your anxiety. So. Movies that tend to have some kind of meaning for us, that over time have some value that in some way enrich our lives, are going to be those movies, those stories, that touch a nerve, that address our fears. As opposed to those movies that you might go and see, you're going to see a movie, it doesn't mean much for you, you come out afterwards and say, well, what has that done for my life? Apart from me taking, apart from taking me two hours closer to death, what, is, what have I got, got out of it? And, um, but movies that genuinely enrich your life, these are the movies that touch a nerve, that help you to address your fears. Narrative anxiety. Now, this is a weird thing, 
because um, I live opposite the Cineplex, and I can see the tribes going towards those darkened caves to watch a flickering screen. I can see the teenagers going to, into that Cineplex, and I can see uh, the uh, families going into that one and the women going into that one to listen to a story that addresses their anxiety. The really weird thing is, though, that once they get in there and they sit down, they want another form of anxiety. They're looking for an anxiety that is best expressed in two words, hope and fear. They want to hope the hero survives and fear he won't. They want to hope Jodie Foster uh, catches the villain and fear she won't. They want to hope Otis finds Milo, but fear he won't. Because I don't know how many of you know this classic story, but it's about a little dog and a little cat, Milo and Otis. Milo's the little cat, a little bit mischievous, a bit naughty. Otis is the little dog trying to be very, very grown up. Milo gets into a lot of trouble, gets in a box, in a river, the box gets swept away, and the kids, I took my son to see, this is the first film we ever saw, he was two years old. He's watching this movie, and everybody's watching this movie, and they're going, oh, I hope Milo survives, I fear he won't. And then, because this river is getting quite rough by now, and Otis is running along by the river barking, and they're, they're thinking, oh, I, I hope Otis helps Milo, but he's only a little dog. Uh, so I fear he won't. And then there's a bear and there's a fox and there's night and everything. And these kids are absolutely gripped by the anxiety of hoping and fearing. They're sitting on the edge of their seats, loving every minute of it. And if you want to know what a, an audience looks like when they're having a good time, this is what they look like. <laughs> you, I mean, you wouldn't really believe that, but that is what they're looking like. So hope and fear, Milo and Otis. But what is weird about Milo and Otis and we're talking about narrative now, is that it's a type of story. It's a type of story that is, you've heard before, you've had it, and you're getting it repeated now. It's the same story as Polans Polanski's Frantic. His wife goes missing, he goes looking for her. Or missing, Costa Gravis is missing. The son goes missing, the father goes looking for him. The, uh, John Ford's The Searchers, The Bicycle Thieves, Saving Private Ryan. Someone goes missing, somebody else goes looking for him. It's a particular kind of story. And as a writer, as a dramatist, as an artist, you know that there is only a finite number of stories. That what are, what, maybe there are seven. Maybe there are 21. Maybe, as George Polty suggests, there are 36 dramatic situations. So you know that you're working within that realm. And consequently, you know that you're going to have to borrow. You're going to have to borrow stories. But are you? There's a finite number of story structures you have to borrow. But do you? As Picasso says, all artists borrow, but great artists steal. When you steal, you make it your own. You absolutely make it your own. You take the taming of the shrew and you turn it into 10 things I hate about you. You absolutely make it your own. He also said another thing about stealing, which is great. He said you, can, you should steal from anyone except yourself. And there's a good reason why you shouldn't steal from yourself. So. The audience then, and nobody will believe you if you, t if you say this to somebody, they won't believe you. What the audience is looking for, and they will not be happy unless they get this, they're looking for an anxiety-ridden experience on a subject that worries them. I mean, if you go to somebody and say, do you want to come out for a bit of a worry tonight? You would probably say, no, thank you very much. I'd rather stay in and do the ironing. <laughs> but actually, you're not going to enjoy it unless you worry. So from bedtime stories to creation myths to sitcoms, and it's interesting about bedtime stories. I mean, you just think how weird it is with bedtime stories. You, pit, you put your kid to bed on his own. You turn out the light. You shut the door. <laughs> I mean, is it any wonder? In those circumstances, you would think that any reasonable child would say, Dad, can I have a gun? <laughs> but they don't. They say, Dad, can I have a story? <laughs> because they know that stories have power, and they don't want any old story. They want the story about the witch in the wardrobe, the monster under the bed, and there's no point in saying there is no witch in the wardrobe, there is no monster under the bed, because they know there is. So from bedtime stories to creation myths, for a long time I lived in Australia, I worked with Aboriginal people. Aboriginal culture is a storytelling culture, centuries old, and it's about addressing the fears of the tribe. Why is the desert like this? Why are the mountains there? Why is there night? 
And all of their stories address these fears. To sitcoms, I can tell you there is no more anxiety-ridden experience than an episode of Faulty Towers. Uh, it's a fantastic anxiety-ridden experience. Bedtime stories, creation myths, sitcoms, stories, if they're going to work, if they're going to have meaning, if they're going to enrich our lives, they're going to help us overcome our fears and lead our lives. The storytellers of the tribe. Now, this is the third uh, of these provocations. And the storytellers of the tribe, I think all of us have a story that needs to be told. But the question is, do we have an audience that needs to hear it? Somebody who I think is really quite good at this is Baz Luhrmann. Baz Luhrmann, I'll just talk about two films very briefly, Strictly Borum, Romeo and Juliet. Strictly Borum, uh, and I was the head of directing at the National Drama School in Australia when he was there and he was working on this uh, play first, which became a movie. Strictly Borum, I think Baz saw as his tribe Australians. He thought this is a story for Australians because it deals with things like the larrikin, the celebration of the rebel which is a very Australian thing, but also deals with that sort of totally unwarranted kind of insecurity conflict, complex, in, uh, inferiority complex that Australians have, which is quite irrational. I think Baz was quite surprised to find that this movie had a wider audience, that it resonated with more people. Romeo and Juliet. Now, Romeo and Juliet is really interesting. Um, who is the tribe here? Who is the audience? I saw this film with nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds. They loved it. This is a story about teenagers, young, young teenagers. It's cast in a way that makes it connect to young people, to teens and preteens. It's shot in a way. It's edited in a way. It's that sort of fast. You'll never thank me for saying this MTV approach. But, it was, uh, uh, but he knew who he was speaking to. He knew who the tribe was. And I saw it, as I say, with nine, ten-year-olds. And they loved the fact, the danger of these two young, crazy, reckless people who are doing something that is going to bring the world crashing down around them. And they really connected with that story of Romeo and Juliet. I, I remember for myself, one of the first plays that I wrote, it was about young people, about teenage, well, teenagers, something like that. And as I, as I was working on it, it became very clear to me that this was not for an audience of teenagers. The ideal audience, the ideal tribe, was their parents. Because they were the ones who were the most anxious about this subject and would most connect with its themes. So I think as a writer, what you should do is you should ask yourself, who is my tribe? Could be Americans, could be women, uh, could be families. Who is my tribe? What is their anxiety? Do I share it? Do I connect with that? What is the story that best addresses that anxiety? So that what I'm suggesting is, as I conclude this talk here, that there is a connection between the flickering campfire and the flickering screen. You can see a direct line uh, that connects you as a modern storyteller to the ancient storyteller who brings the tribe into the cave, a darkened cave around a flickering fire, to tell them the story that they need to hear, that is going to be helpful to them. To the modern storyteller who brings the disparate tribe together or separately into the darkened cave of a cineplex around a flickering screen, once again to address their anxieties and to address their fears. So. Uh, in a sense, that's as far as my talk goes. I now come to the bit where you may remember I said at the beginning of this talk that I would set you something really difficult to do, and this is what it is. I want you to take 60 seconds to think about two stories about yourself. Two stories about yourself. Major moments from your life. Um, maybe moments of triumph, tr moments of tragedy, uh, exciting moments, heroic whatever. Maybe the first time you were arrested or something would be a good story, or, uh, or the second time would be even better, perhaps. <laughs> okay, so that's the kind of story. I want something that's really got something to it in your recent, recent life. You think you are the world's leading authority on this subject. Nobody knows this better than you. You are the authority. However, I want one of these stories to be true and one to be absolutely a lie. I want it to be totally true and totally a lie. A 100% true story told with conviction that we're going to believe. A 100% lie, as far as you can, a 100% lie told with conviction that we're going to believe. I want the kind of story where you tell me the story about that terrible thing that you did to your brother when you went to Liverpool. 
A, if you've never done that to anyone. B, if you don't have a brother. And C, if you've never been to Liverpool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick somebody from the audience, somebody who looks least, least like they want to do it, and <laughs> I'm going to get them to come out here, sit on a chair which I'm going to place here, and to tell us these two, two stories. Now, your task is to get us to believe that both are true. So we're going to listen to these stories. You're going to tell the two stories. Then we're going to discuss them. And then we're going to vote. So you have to be prepared to tell us which one is true. Everybody got that? 60 seconds starts now. OK, there's a lot of danger. Just take a risk. Take a risk. Tell me about the time you were recruited by the CIA or the time you discovered your sister was a stripper. You know, <laughs> tell me those kind of stories. OK, you've got 60 seconds to think about it. Suddenly, everyone has to go to the loo. <laughs> OK. Can you do this? You can? OK. Come out here. <laughs> What's your name? Nafe. Nafe? Yeah. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Paul. Take a seat. This is the microphone. Now, what I want you to do is just make these stories last about 60 seconds. Tell us these two stories and convince us that both of them are true so that when we listen to these, we really cannot tell the difference between which one is true and which is a lie. Okay? okay. Off you go, now. Okay. So the King's Speech has just been released. I've seen the tra trailer. Now, as someone who has stammered through all my life, the trailer inspires me. Not the film, the trailer. That's important. And what would someone like me do? Someone who never speaks up in class, someone who never even answers the phone or orders his own food because he's always stammered. Well, I do what any crazy kid would do. I decide to join the debate team. I decide to take part in the annual school speech competition. I'm going to go up on stage and speak in front of the entire student body and hopefully not make a fool out of myself. So after crazy practicing day and night, every day, rectifying my speech, gargling my throat, drinking water all the time, making sure that everything's absolutely right. I go on to speech. I go onto the stage, and I'll be honest with you, I can't feel my feet at this point. I don't know how it got to the stage, but I somehow managed to get there. I take a deep breath, and I'm like, and, and the topic was optimism here. <laughs> so, and, I, and I'm standing there, I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> okay, let, let's do this. I can't think of this one, so I'm like, is the glass half full or half empty? That's how I started my speech, and without even for a second, I didn't stammer. And after that, I made myself join the debate team, parliamentary debates, which are even much more aggressive, and people are going to interrupt you and harass you. And I joined that, and I ended up representing my school at the nationals. And I won a Best Speaker Award, and I led my school to their first victory in six years. That is fantastic. That's a really, really good story. That's a really good story, and you told that with absolute conviction. Tell us the second story. Here it goes. It's the May of 1999. My pa parents, out of the blue, take my br brother and I to Barcelona. And guess what my dad does? He gets us tickets to the UEFA Champions League final, soccer, football. So, but I'm going to call it <laughs> football. F football now, because that's what it's actually called. <laughs> Manchester United versus Bayern Munich. Oh. Manchester United has just won the English Premier League and the FA Cup and are on to go on to win a treble. Bayern Munich, same thing. They won the do domestic league and the domestic cup, and they won the treble as well. The match begins. The crowd is going insane at this point. People are taking the shirts off because that's what you do when you're going insane. You don't have anything else to do. <laughs> Six minutes go in, Bayern Munich gets a free kick. They score a bloody goal. Like, I mean, are you kidding me? It's a six-minute, and Mario Basel ends up scoring a goal and quiet down the entire stadium. 90th minute, the match is about to end. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Alex Ferguson does two substitutions, Solskjaer and Sherrington. 
David Beckham gets a corner kick. Corner, Sherrington scores a goal. One all. Five seconds afterwards, David Beckham gets one more corner kick. And Saul Shire ends up scoring a goal. And within just 30 seconds, the entire match is won. And Manchester United wins their first treble in God knows how long. Amazing. So, yeah, and you were there. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Now, <clears throat> I want you to switch off totally. Give us no more information. Don't respond to anything, anything that we say, okay? Now, these are two, you did a great job. These are, these are two <clears throat> really good stories. Two really good stories. But one of them did not happen. So the question is, is this the kind of guy who leads the kind of wonderful life with a great beginning, middle, and end? Not only does he get inspired by a movie and overcomes his disability, becomes this and actually wins. Now, is that true? Did that happen? Is that the kind of guy who would do that? You're not allowed to vote because you know him. OK? <laughs> OK? Um, or is this a guy who's got this amazing dad who just somehow magically produces this ticket to Barcelona with two tickets for the European Cup final? Amazing. Now, one of these is true. And I must say, I find myself very insecure about this because you told both stories and they're exceedingly well. One is true, the other is a lie. I really have to think about this. Very briefly, off the top of your head, which do you believe and why? You can change your mind. We're going to vote in a minute. You don't think that he could have seen that on television? <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's vote on this then. Give us no information, OK? Wow. OK, so we're going to vote on this. Those who believe the first story is true, this is the uh, uh, speech therapy story. Those the debating team, those who think that's true, raise your hands. Those who believe the second story is true, this is the Barcelona story. Now, this is fantastic. You have divided us really pretty evenly. We are so insecure. So now you've got to tell us which one is true. The, the first one was true. Whoa! <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, look, <laughs> to end this talk, I said I was going to leave you with two things to take away, two things of value to take away. Here are the two things. That was absolutely brilliant, you know? Um, two things to take away. These are the two things you're taking away. I asked you to come up with a true story and lie. You've each got a true story and lie now. As you go away from here with that true story and lie, enjoy telling it to other people. Enjoy telling them to other people. Uh, enjoy trying to convince them of the truthfulness of your lies. But think at the same time, you may very well have with these two stories the germ of a, of a great idea for a short film. I mean, when I think about that speech therapy story, that is really a great story. <laughs> um, if not a germ, maybe you've got two great ideas for two short films, or maybe the germ of a great idea for a feature length film. But either way, uh, enjoy your role as storytellers. Uh, enjoy con convincing others of the truthfulness of your lies, and take the responsibility very seriously because it is a noble, noble tradition. Thank you.